first ask everyone who's participating, if you could just drop in the chat, if you have or have not um, watched the recent film, Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, so again, if, if you could just indicate in the chat, if you've seen the movie, um, if you haven't seen the movie, if you plan on seeing the movie, um, just as a, you know, kind of a, a frame of reference um, uh, for this evening. And what I will say at the outstart is that it's definitely, um, I've seen the movie um, myself and, and I would recommend um, Africans view it. And then of course, along with viewing it uh, to, to conduct uh, further study on the topic, of course. Um, but, but the, and we'll discuss the film throughout the course of this evening's workshop. And then what I would also like to say is that how we are going to approach this historical period and this event is not going to be in a linear sense of beginning, middle, developments, climax, and then an ending. We're going to approach this particular event in our history from numerous perspectives, and, and we're going to uh, utilize a, a multi-dimensional approach. So as we are kind of you know, making progress, it'll help us all to keep in mind that the goal shouldn't be necessarily to study and analyze this event in that linear fashion if we can adopt a more nuanced and complex uh, approach to this event, we'll, we'll have a, uh, an easier, or I shouldn't say an easier, we will, we will have a, a much more efficient um, time in terms of learning about it and, and conducting our analysis. So with that being said, the overview for this evening's workshop is as follows. We will begin with our analysis, um, looking at the Black Panther Party in context, just to give a brief synopsis of the party the notable things and, and, and contributions that that organization, one of our greatest organizations, um, has made. And then we'll go into the life of beloved uh, Brother Chairman Fred Hampton. And then we'll break down the December 4th, 1969 raid that led to his, um, his murder. And then we're going to, again, using that multidimensional approach, we're going to analyze COINTELPRO, the FBI's counterintelligence program. Um, and then we'll do some reflection on the film, Judas and the Black Messiah. And then of course, we always cite our sources and provide references for every piece of information that we facilitate in political education. And then we'll go ahead and close it out. So again, just to give some uh, foundation or, or to lay the groundwork on the Black Panther Party. So the Black Panther Party was originally titled the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense and it was founded October of 1966 in Oakland, California by our brothers Bobby Seal and Huey P. Newton. Um, um, at the time, uh, Huey P. Newton was 24 and Bobby Seal was 30 years old. Um, one of the notable contributions made by this party um, was the notion of a 10 point program and this 10 point program, while simple in terms of its uh, presentation and its you know, uh, uh, organization of, of priorities, it has proven to be very groundbreaking and, and uh, impactful for the future, the foreseeable future uh, of black organizing today. And then another thing they were known for were their survival programs as Huey P. Newton uh, named them. There was the free breakfast program. They organized free health clinics. They conducted neighborhood armed patrols along with after school programs. So now that we've kind of uh, introduced the Black Panther Party, we are going to discuss the life um, of our brother, Fred Hampton, because it's also important that while the December 1969 raid that ended his life, we don't want that to be the uh, majority of our analysis of our brother because he was so much more um, than just that one night, right? So young Fred Hampton was born August 30th, 1948 in Argo, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. In that home in Argo, they were neighbors. Um, Fred Hampton and his family were neighbors to Mammy Till and her son Emmett, Emmett Till. Um, and it was, it was actually documented that Fred's mother, Iberia, sometimes watched Emmett 
along with her own children. And again, doing away with the linear timeline or the, you know, the, the kind of sequential uh, um, study of things, we're going to kind of go from different vantage points and perspectives with intention. Um, it's important that we situate the life of Fred Hampton within the larger uh, 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 regional and global context of the society. And then in 1958, so when Fred was 10 years old, him and his family moved to Maywood, another suburb um, of Chicago, Illinois. Young Fred Hampton in his sophomore and junior years was reading black political authors, including Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, and W.E.B. Du Bois. Doris Streeter, a Maywood Village board member who was taking a course in African-American history, asked Fred for advice for a bibliography for her term paper. In spite of Fred's hectic schedule and his constant harassment by the police, he took the time to come over to our house with a huge stack of books and materials, she said. Fred was an immensely well-read young man who rose early and read at least two hours before he faced the day. Fred tape recorded and memorized the speeches of both Dr. King and Malcolm X. Now, mind you, this is Fred Hampton in high school, in the middle of his high school, of his time in high school, sophomore, junior year. So he's about 15, 16 years old. The reason why we need to be sure we aren't limiting our understandings of Fred Hampton to, you know, uh, uh, I am revolutionary, you know, uh, um, leading the party and, and, you know, being assassinated by the Chicago pigs and the FBI is because we, we if we limit ourselves to that, we miss out on the truly beautiful and, and intelligent, right, African spirit that Fred Hampton was in his albeit short life. At Proviso East, this is uh, Fred Hampton's high school, he encountered inequalities that infuriated him. He recognized that the mostly white faculty and entirely white administration did not adequately prepare the black students for the technological world around them. Fred spoke out demanding more black teachers and black administrators at the school. The year after Hampton graduated, the principal called Fred back to ease growing racial tensions. He put together a joint plan to empower each of the student groups and give them a voice in how the school was run. Fred found jobs for some of the many unemployed black teenagers in his neighborhood as well and successfully pushed the village of Maywood to, find, to fund a summer job program. Brother Fred Hampton was always a, a, a brilliant organizer and, and a a true soldier for our people, right? When we examine his organizing, going back to his, his time in high school, we can see him speaking out, demanding black teachers, black administrators, pushing for many things that we are still uh, uh, engaged in to this day. Again, we need to be sure that we are not limiting Fred Hampton, or Fred Hampton or any of our ancestors to one particular event or one particular speech, right? So the purpose of us conducting this analysis on young Fred Hampton is to avoid that limitation of our understanding of him. Our specific concern to Fred was the absence of a, muni of a municipal swimming pool too far from Lake Michigan for trips to the beach. Maywood had no amenities to provide blacks with relief from Chicago's very hot and sticky summers. The white kids went to the pool at the private veteran industrial park in neighboring Bellwood, but black kids were not allowed. Though Fred couldn't swim, he couldn't swim. <laughs> he and his friends carpooled black kids from Maywood to a Chicago Park District pool in the suburb of Lyons, several miles away. He began to talk to the kids and their parents about organizing a public pool in Maywood. The reason why I repeated the fact that Fred Hampton could not swim was that how many of us could think of one other young person, right? Whether it's historically or contemporarily, a young person who is so in tune with their surroundings and with the uh, inequalities in society that they are willing to put aside their own self-interest and pursue the, the greater good of the collective of their peers. Fred Hampton couldn't swim. Fred Hampton is 15, 16 years old, organizing and carpooling young black children to the nearest swimming pool during the hot summer. He couldn't swim himself. Again, this is demonstrating the spirit of Fred Hampton, giving nuance to his keen self-awareness and truly his brilliance as a young African. 
Fred's outspokenness earned the attention of Don Williams, the head of the West Suburban NAACP chapter. There was no active unit of the youth branch of the NAACP in the Western suburbs. So Williams asked Fred if he would organize one. In 1965, he started the West Suburban Youth Chapter of the NAACP with Fred as the chair and grew to more than 200 members in less than a year. Fred's evolution cannot be separated from the political events and movements around him. He was reading Mao Zedong, Che Guevara and Ho Chi Minh and identified with the socialist struggles of the third world. Notice the rapid ascension in organizing. Notice the, the aggressive uh, expansion, right, of time, energy, and resources in the life of Fred Hampton. He goes from, right, as, as a, a young uh, high school student working and talking with his peers in high school, coming up with plans to empower student groups and then he's noticed by leadership in the NAACP, the local NAACP, and he's recruited to, to chair a new chapter. We study Fred Hampton this way so that we can know what it means to recognize the power and the potential in African youth today. There's a Fred Hampton, I saw this real, real quick sidebar. Um, there was this, uh, uh, I saw something on Twitter, a young sister had tweeted something, this was just after Judas and the Black Messiah was uh, released. She said that there's a Fred Hampton in every city. And that is so profound because it's true. In every high school with black children, uh, with black youth, right, with, in every college campus, there is a young Fred Hampton there. And they may not be this larger than life, braggadocious, uh, uh, you know, magnanimous figure, but they have that fire. They have that spirit and that potential. We study Fred Hampton this way so that we can unearth and, and uh, put to work that potential and that spirit in African youth today. In 1966, high school senior Fred Hampton was working on his own version of Black empowerment. He set up a Black cultural center in Maywood with a Black history section and continues his campaign to hire more Black teachers and administrators at Proviso East. During this period, two young Californians were similarly engaged. They demanded more Black administrators and Black history courses at Merritt College in Oakland, California. One was 24-year-old Huey P. Newton, the other 30-year-old Bobby Seal. See, this is the, 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 importance of expanding our analysis of our ancestors, of our predecessors, because we can see here, right, while Fred Hampton was based in Illinois and Chicago, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale are, are effectively leading the charge around the same issues in California, in Oakland. And of course, at the time, neither group knew each other, but the work was being done. We study our ancestors this way to connect those dots and to draw those parallels so that we can then take from those historical moments and, and, and incidents lessons to apply to the contemporary and say, well, if I'm organizing here in uh, Long Beach, California or, or, or Sacramento, California, or if I'm in Houston, Texas, wherever I may find myself, I'm organizing and I'm working here guaranteed there's at least one other African in another city in another state organizing and working toward the same goals. This is critical. In March 1968, Stokely Carmichael and H. Rat Brown came to Chicago and shortly thereafter opened a SNCC office on the south side on 43rd Street. Fred went to the office and invited Stokely to speak in Maywood. A few weeks later, Fred introduced him at a large Maywood rally. Fred's introduction was so impressive that Bobby Rush and Bob Brown, the two leaders of Chicago's SNCC chapter, came up to Fred afterward and introduced themselves. So we can see how Fred Hampton as, as, a, as a youth in high school, how his work and his efforts and his spirit essentially uh, uh, propelled him right to the forefront of leadership among the mightiest Africans around. We had Stokely, Stokely Carmichael, or also known as Kwame Toure. We have H. Rat Brown, now known as Jamil Abdullah Alamin. We have all of these mighty Africans who recognize and observe that spirit in Fred Hampton. And so they put him in the right position to lead to, and to organize and to mobilize the masses, right? 
Later that year, Bobby Rush went to Oakland where he met with the Panther Central Committee. He returned with a mandate to form a Panther chapter in Chicago and the first person he recruited was Fred Hampton and they opened the Panther office in November, 1968. In four years, Fred had evolved from organizing for black homecoming queens and municipal swimming pools to becoming chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers. By 1968, he was advocating revolution. We trace this uh, history and this trajectory, right, of Fred Hampton because it's so, so critical, right? We can see how mighty Africans get put in proper positions. We see how the sacrifices and the dedication and the commitment made by the youth end up uh, formulating into tangible things, right? A Chicago chapter was, was uh, uh, produced out of a, a central committee mandate and Bobby Rush, who just earlier in the year, right, just earlier in 1968, watched a young Fred Hampton with that fire and with that spirit and passion, right? And he noticed him and said, well, if we're opening up a Panther chapter in Chicago, we don't need to, you know, conduct job interviews or, you know, uh, put out an application. We recognize their brilliance, you know, in our communities, right? Uh, so that, that connection, again, is so, so critical when we study Fred Hampton because he was such a, a spirit that it, he really could not be captured in just a, a, a particular you know, month or one singular event. Fred and the Panthers sought alliances with other groups in Chicago. One of them was the Young Lords Organization, oh. which had started as a Puerto Rican street gang. The Panthers, Young Lords, and Young Patriots, an organization of white Southern youth from Uptown, formed their own Rainbow Coalition, a precursor to Jesse Jackson's to protest police brutality and abuse in Chicago and support the Panther demand for community control of police. So now we have conducted our uh, uh, tracing the trajectory of Fred Hampton to his current position, right? how we've situated him um, as the chairman, the new chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. This is November, 1968. Now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of shift our perspective and, and we're going to trace the growth and the expansion of opposition to not just Black Panther Party activities, but Black activities in general in the area, right? So here we have uh, the Cook County State's Attorney, Edward Hanrahan. In his public speeches after he was elected Cook County State's Attorney in 1968, Hanrahan referred to the Panthers as a gang. He presented himself as the guardian of law and order, defending society against black chaos and violence. After he took office in January 1969, he created a nine-man special prosecutions unit to deal with gangs. He appointed his former assistant, Richard Jalovet, to be in charge of the SPU. In June, an additional team of police officers led by Sergeant Daniel Groth was added. It included Officer James Gloves Davis, a black cop notorious for brutally beating black youth after he put on black leather gloves. We need to be sure our analysis of any ancestor or organization is as thorough and rigorous as possible. We cannot simply take a particular event and just read about that. History does not occur in a vacuum. Things develop people grow, people are placed into certain positions and they exact their agenda, whatever it may be. So we just traced the trajectory of Fred Hampton from high school to his current position as chairman. And now we have to do the same thing for the opposition. We have to do the same thing for the enemy. We can't simply say, oh, this big bad, you know, uh, uh, boogie monster is just in our way. We have to be more intentional and critical not only in the study of our people and our organizations, along with the study of our enemies, right? Organizations, systems, institutions. A Cook County State's attorney is not a, a, a small position. It is not a, a position of, of little authority or power. It's a very powerful position. The Cook County, the Cook County corrections uh, system is the largest in the country. And you have the state's attorney who has just been appointed at the same time, right? There are those parallels again, appointed at the same time as Fred Hampton is, is put in the position of chairman. So we have to trace those trajectories accordingly. On June 4th, 1969, a week after Fred went to prison, he was sentenced uh, to two to five years at Menard Prison in Southern Illinois, which is uh, 350 miles 
from Chicago, FBI agents led by Chicago's special agent in charge, or SAC, Marlon Johnson, raided the Panther headquarters. They had obtained a special agent in charge, or no, I'm sorry, they had, a, they had obtained a search warrant by swearing before a judge that George Sams, a fugitive, was present in the office. Listen to this, this is, this is important. Sams had been there in the uh, um, Panther headquarters in Chicago, but left 48 hours earlier. So George Sams was present in the Chicago headquarters on June 2nd, 1969, right? FBI agents and the Chicago SAC obtain a search warrant by swearing before a judge that he's there. George Sams is present in the Panther headquarters, right? Looking for George Sams was the official reason for FBI raids on Panther offices in at least two other cities. In each instance, Sams left shortly before the raid. It was later revealed that Sams was an FBI informant. He went to these offices to provide the FBI the pretext for a raid. When we get to our, our analysis of COINTELPRO, we will see how conflict is engineered and prosecution is fabricated institutionally, systematically by the FBI, Chicago law enforcement, so on and so forth. That needs to also be properly situated. On July 31st, while Justice Schaefer was considering granting Hampton bail, the Chicago police and the Panthers exchanged gunfire at the Panther headquarters. The police said the incident started with sniper fire, but several witnesses said the police opened fire on the Panther office without provocation. Five police officers were wounded and three Panthers, Larry White, Dwight Corbett, and Alfred Jeffries were arrested. The office was ransacked and Panther property was seized and never returned. A few days later, Justice Schaefer granted Fred Hampton's petition for an appeal bond, allowing him to be released from prison. On August 13th, he returned to Chicago, and the next day the Panthers had him speak at the Church of the Epiphany, known as the People's Church, located at Ashland and Adams. In October, so this is 1969, in October, Fred was still spending some nights at his parents' home in Maywood and some in other Panther apartments. Deborah Johnson was seven months pregnant with Fred's baby. She and Fred wanted to live together. They rented a small five-room apartment on the first floor of a two-story flat at 2337 West Monroe, one street over from the Panther office. It quickly became a Panther hangout. The FBI and local police immediately took note of Fred's new address. From the time Fred and Deborah moved in, there were guns kept at 2337 West Monroe. While the outer doors were locked, the tiny locks at the front and rear were not enforced. As for security, people with guns were normally assigned to stay awake by the front door when, when Fred slept there. Before we proceed, I want for us to really think critically about how much occurs from November 1968 to Fred's death, December 1969. In 11 months, all of this is happening raids on the Panther headquarters, Fred being thrown in jail. All of these things are occurring while the Panther Party is still providing free breakfast for children, free health clinics, armed patrols, so on and so forth. 11 months. This is all taking place. This is why we can't necessarily study this particular piece of history in a linear fashion, in a, in a sequential uh, order, so to speak because we have to be able to draw those parallels. We have to be able to uh, observe from those different perspectives and vantage points. So now we have the raid, the raid itself, right? On the morning of December 4th, 1969, just as soon as the Chicago police entered the door, the first thing they did was to shoot and kill Mark Clark, who was on security watch. That was not a mere coincidence. That was a deliberate hit. The police knew exactly where Mark would be sitting from the information provided to them and the diagrams that were drawn up by William O'Neill. They knew that they had they knew that they had to first take out Mark in order to get to Fred. Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were killed. Deborah Johnson, Berlina Brewer, Ronald Satchel, Blair Anderson, Brenda Harris, Harold Bell, and Louis Trulock survived. So as we discuss the raid and the, the aftermath of the raid, this is where the timeline gets kind of complicated because we're not analyzing it in that beginning to end fashion because there's just so much to really unpack and to study that to do it in a, lean, a linear way just isn't feasible. And um, these, as a matter of fact, these, um, all of these quotes and these excerpts come from this book, The Assassination of Fred Hampton, written by Jeffrey Haas, who was the uh, main defense lawyer for the surviving Panthers in this raid. This book is 
is is the um the uh the pinnacle of analysis and coverage of again not just the raid but the events leading up to it and the events that transpired subsequently um fred never really woke up we were sleeping i woke up hearing shots from the front and back i shook fred but he didn't open his eyes Deborah demonstrated how he had she had pushed against fred several times trying to wake him at one point he sort of raised up and then laid back down again she repeated that he never opened his eyes. I got on top of him to try to protect him from the bullets. She said the shooting stopped only after someone in the bedroom with her yelled, we got a pregnant sister in here. And in this excerpt right here, Deborah Johnson is speaking directly to the author of this book, Jeffrey House. This is the, the mere hours after the raid takes place. Jeffrey House is, you know, he rushes down to the police station and, and is talking with the surviving Panthers to try to get some idea of what happened. On the evening of December 3rd, 1969, shortly before the planned raid, infiltrator O'Neill seems to have slipped Hampton a substantial dose of sec seco barbitol in a glass of Kool-Aid. The, the, the Black Panther Party leader was thus comatose in his bed when the 14-man police team, armed with a submachine gun and other special hardware, slammed, slammed into his home at about 4 a.m. on the morning of December 4th. He was nonetheless shot three times, once more or less slightly in the chest, and then twice more in the head at point blank range. Also killed was Mark Clark, head of the Peoria, Illinois Black Panther Party chapter, wounded were Panthers, Ronald Satchel, Blair Anderson, and Verlina, Bre Verlina Brewer. Panthers Deborah Johnson, Brenda Harris, Louis Trulock, and Harold Bell were uninjured during the shooting. Despite the fact that no Panther had fired a shot, with the possible exception of Clark, who may have squeezed off a single round during his death convulsions, while the police pumped at least 98 rounds into the apartment, the survivors were all beaten while handcuffed, charged with ag aggressive assault and attempted murder of the Raiders and held on $100,000 bond apiece. So there are two main accounts to the story, or I should say two published, uh, two, two published accounts of the raid itself. There's the pig version, and the Panther version. That's a good way for us to organize it. So the pig version repeated much of Edward Hanrahan's press statement and added that he was going to charge all the surviving occupants with attempted murder of the police. An additional statement from Sergeant Groth was included. As we entered, a girl who was lying on a bed in the living room fired a blast from a shotgun at us and a 45 cal caliber pistol was found in Hampton's hand when officers entered a rear bedroom and found him lying in a pool of blood on a bed. A shotgun was found next to the bed. That's the pig version. The Panther version is as follows. Bobby Rush, Deputy Minister of Defense for the Black Panther Party said Thursday that, Black Panther, that, that Panther Chairman Fred Hampton was murdered while he slept in bed. We can prove that. Rush said at a press conference on the steps outside the blood spattered first floor apartment at 2337 West Monroe, the scene of Thursday's Panther police shootout. <clears throat> This vicious murder of Chairman Fred and Mark Clark, our defense minister from Peoria, was implemented by that dog Nixon and, and Hanrahan and all the rest of the pigs. Hampton never fired back when the pigs came into his bedroom and shot Fred in the head. He couldn't have fired back because he was asleep. So those are the two versions of the story, or I should say the two accounts of the story, the pig, the pig version and the panther version. So now we're going to examine the evidence in the specific raid itself, and again, Doing this is going to be a bit complicated because we're not doing it in that beginning to end fashion because that isn't how it transpired. If, if, if you all read this book, you'll notice that when it comes to prosecution and the law and, and whether it's attempting you know, indictments of pigs or it's whatever the, the, the situation is, it's very, very complicated and it is not at all a clear linear process, right? So our analysis of the topic will reflect that reality. So this raid takes place early Thursday morning, around four in the morning. Later that same day, the two accounts are given, the press statement by the, the pigs, Edward Hanrahan and so on. And that same day, the Panthers give their version, the, the truth of what really happened. This is all in the same day, mind you. The raid takes place four in the morning on Thursday. Bobby Rush is giving a press conference later that Thursday. Then on Monday, December 8th, um, this is Herbert McDonald. He was a, 
a forensic scientist and firearms expert based in New York. He was called in to consult the uh, defense lawyers as they prepared to defend the surviving Panthers and, and beat the charges of attempted murder and aggressive assault. Because again, at the end of the raid, Mark Clark is killed, Fred Hampton is killed, the surviving Panthers are arrested and charged with attempted murder of police officers. So in no way is this, is this event um, um, just over. That just, did, that, that isn't how it happened. So on Monday, December 8th, McDonald examined, measured, and photographed the locations, directions, and diameters of the bullet holes throughout the apartment and gathered what remained of bullet fragments and shell casings. He showed Skip, Skip was one of the defense lawyers, that a bullet makes a larger hole as it exits the wall than when it enters and the wood is splayed outward at the exit hole. Thus, we could look at the bullet holes in the apartment and determine the direction from which they had been fired. McDonald confirmed that except for one of the two bullets in the front door, all the 80 or more shots poured in from the direction of the police entering the apartment. Examining the evidence in this particular event is very, very critical, right? Because we can walk around and say, uh, uh, the pigs killed Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. That's true. That there's no ticking away from that. It's important for us to study and intentionally examine how and why those things happened, right? So we have the aftermath of the raid. By 1971, the Panthers in Chicago and nationally had diminished in size and influence. They weren't recruiting new members and the Chicago chapter never regained the size it was before Fred's murder. No one could replace Fred's charisma, energy, or organizing ability. The Panthers fought back in new and sophisticated ways. They used the Freedom of Information Act to make public thousands of pages of FBI and CIA documents detailing government repression against them. Listen to all the defendants in this uh, federal suit. In 1976, so this is uh, uh, seven years removed from the raid that took place in 1969, they launched Black Panther Par Party versus Levi a federal civil rights action against officials in the Justice Department, the CIA, the FBI, the departments of the Army, Treasury, and Justice. So those are that's just three departments alone, right? Then we have the IRS, the US Postal Service, and other agencies for conspiring to destroy their organization financially and politically. It's important that we really emphasize the magnitude of the repression and the opposition to Panther activity. We need to understand this because that's what we're up against today. It may seem difficult to imagine or to, to fathom, but it's the reality. Any seriously organized and, and, and uh, effective organization is eventually going to face this level of opposition. That's why we're studying this the way we are. So as to learn from the past and hopefully better prepare for the future, because it isn't a question of if, but when we face that repression and that opposition. The Panthers accused the defendants of burglaries, raids, unlawful opening of mail, false arrests, auditing Huey Newton's tax returns, placing an undercover agent in the apartment next to Newton in 1971, conspiring with US members to kill Bunchy Carter and John Huggins in 1969, January 1969, sending false letters, infiltrating the BPP with provocateurs, murdering the Chicago Panther Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, sabotaging and discrediting Black Panther Party programs, suppressing the party's right to free expression and other acts of general harassment. In the summer of 1977, so a year after, the, the suit is uh, um, established or filed. The FBI conceded that it had between 1.5 and 2 million pages documenting the Panthers. Again, this level of repression and opposition and the, and the amount of resources that are poured into this repression need to be understood. We can't simply think that uh, you know, all we're doing is, is uh, fighting for our rights and fighting for equality. We need to develop a much more uh, sobered and nuanced understanding of our position of, of what we have 
going for us and what we are up against. If we don't have those things, then we won't get very far. So now, uh, in, uh, I'm gonna show y'all all the books. Um, Mark Clark, Soul of a Black Panther, um, written by Gloria Clark Jackson, a sibling um, of Mark Clark. In her book, which was actually just published, um, it was actually just published last year, 2020. Um, she gives her own account of um, the events and the aftermath of the raid. Because again, the raid wasn't this um, open and shut case. It was, it was a, a highly complicated one, right? So she says, during the 13 years, the first trial lasted for 18 months and ended with a hung jury. The presiding judge, Sam Perry, threw out the whole case and assessed in, assessed in costs $100,000 against the Panther survivors. So the first trial, and remember, the surviving Panthers were charged with attempted murder of the police. There was no uh, uh, prosecution in any way, shape, or form against any of the pigs, against Hanrahan, against the FBI. This first trial is defending the, the surviving Panthers, the Panthers that survived the raid. It lasted 18 months and ended in a hung jury, right? And, and not only did it end in a hung jury, the presiding judge actually charged monetarily the surviving Panthers for the cost of the case. So that was the first trial. Because Judge Perry had made errors in handling the case and should have ordered a retrial rather than throwing the entire case out, the plaintiffs were able to appeal to the Seventh Circuit, to the Seventh Circuit. In April 1979, 1979, this is 10 years after the raid takes place. During the Seventh Circuit proceedings, in a separate case regarding a rogue police officer, it was revealed that William O'Neill, who was Fred Hampton's bodyguard, was actually an FBI informant. 10 years after the raid takes place, it's first discovered. It's, it's I, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say discovered. It's officially uh, uh, documented and proven 10 years afterwards. The Seventh Circuit reversed Judge Perry's decision and found there to be substantial evidence of a conspiracy between the FBI, State's Attorney Edward Hanrahan, and the 14 police raiders for obstructing justice and suppressing nearly 200 volumes of documents. During the trials, FBI documents showed that William O'Neill had given a floor plan that included the layout of the rooms, the placement of doors and furniture, the identity of the apartment's occupants and the location of the bedrooms. Testimony was given by defendant Marlon Johnson, special agent in charge of the Chicago office of the FBI, who confirmed from an FBI document that the FBI had a memo that stated that on November 21st, 1969, the Chicago police and the state's attorney's office had been told that there were numerous weapons inside the Panther apartment, but the guns were apparently legally purchased. Officers Jalovic and Groth drafted a search warrant under the pretense of illegal weapons. The planned raid was back on for December 3rd, 1969, but it was later changed to 4 a.m. of December 4th, claiming that they wanted to make sure everyone would be home. It was later discovered no illegal guns were, reco were ever recovered from the apartment. And mind you, this second trial is not to determine the guilt of any pigs and death of Mark Clark nor Fred Hampton. This second trial is to determine the innocence or the guilt of the pigs in obstruction of justice and suppression of evidence. At least in the beginning, there was never any concern with who or who killed Fred Hampton or how. It's important that we understand these, these seemingly small but truly significant you know nuances in this history after 13 long years of court battles state attorney hanrahan and the police officers involved in the raid who had been indicted by a grand jury for obstructing justice and conspiracy to present false evidence were acquitted of all charges as part of the settlement agreement so you have the december 4th 1969 raid of Fred Hampton's apartment at 2337 West Monroe. Mark Clark and Fred Hampton are murdered. 
the surviving Panthers are charged with attempted murder, that first trial ends as, as a result of a hung jury. A second trial is started, right? And Hanrahan and the pigs are charged with obstructing justice, obstruction of justice and conspiracy to present false evidence. And they're indicted, their guilt is proven. The case is settled that if the pigs and Hanrahan are acquitted of their charges, the pigs would drop the charges against the surviving Panthers of attempted murder and aggressive assault. This history alone should be ample evidence and reasoning for the total rejection and lack of faith by African people in the legal systems of the United States. This is exhibit A, arguably, because you can see how the, the strings are pulled and the, the bureaucracy and the politics are really maneuvered in a way that justice is, is a, a, a falsehood for African people. It's an illusion, at least in the current context of the US legal system, right? In 1983, the federal government's Justice Department, the city of Chicago and Cook County settled the lawsuit filed by survivors and the families of Clark and Hampton for $1.82 million. In 1983, right, 14 years, 13 years, 14 years after the raid takes place, the, the suit is settled. There is no sentencing, there is no conviction, there is no indictment. Charges are simply dropped. Again, this is, this is a prime example, in my eyes at least, that in no way, shape or form should African people invest in or rely upon this imperial nation's legal system to award justice or to declare justice and proclaim justice for African people. The Hampton Clark assassinations were unique in that the cover stories of involved police and local officials quickly unraveled Notwithstanding the FBI's best efforts to help keep the lid on, there was a point when the sheer blatancy of the lies used to explain what had happened, the obvious falsification of ballistics and other evidence and so on, led to the indictment of state's attorney Hanrahan, Jalovec, and a dozen Chicago police personnel for conspiring to obstruct justice. This was dropped by Chicago Judge Philip Remitty on November 1st, 1972. Again, this is the, the drop these charges to drop these as part of a quid pro quo arrangement in which remaining charges were dropped against the Panther survivors. The latter then joined the mothers of the deceased in a $47 million civil rights suit against not only the former state defendants, but a number of Chicago police investigators who had cleared the Raiders of wrongdoing and the FBI as well. So now we're going to analyze um, the FBI's counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, which by no means um, is, is uh, done or, or uh, uh, finished. It's still very much a reality. I'm sure they just call it by a different name. In March 1971, anti-war protesters who later identified themselves as the Citizens Committee to investigate the FBI broke into an FBI office in Media, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia. After the break-in, they clandestinely began releasing documents they had seized. These documents exposed the secret FBI counterintelligence program known as COINTELPRO. One of the documents they released was a memo from FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover to all FBI offices ordering FBI agents in all cities with Panther chapters to develop, quote, hard-hitting programs designed to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize black nationalist organizations, including SNCC and the Nation of Islam. Another stated objective was, quote, to prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. Stokely Carmichael, Elijah Muhammad, uh, Stokely Carmichael, Dr. King, and Elijah Muhammad were named as potential messiahs. Hoover ordered that COINTELPRO's existence be kept secret. Every office was to report directly to him on its efforts to carry out the program's mandates. It's critical that we note how this information was uh, uh, distributed 
a group of protesters, the Citizens Committee to investigate the FBI, broke into an FBI office and seized these documents. The question becomes, had that not taken place or had that failed, would we ever have the information we have now of the COINTELPRO program, of the, the, the infamous quote, preventing the rise of a messiah? Right. This is why we conduct our analysis this way, because we can't simply assume events just kind of transpire uh, uh, with a natural kind of linear flow in time. Things are disrupted. Things are, are uh, uh, implemented at certain points in time. Right. That then subsequently lead to information being distributed, information being exposed or, or not exposed. Right. And again, this is March of 1971. So in the in 1968, 1969, knowledge of a COINTEL Pro was non-existent. There were talks of, you know, informants and things like that, but never was was it common knowledge or even uncommon knowledge that such a thing existed. It only happened as a result of this committee breaking into an FBI office and seizing those documents and releasing them. Between 1968 and 1971, so three years, FBI initiated terror and disruption resulted in the murder of Black Panthers Arthur Morris, Bobby Hutton, Stephen Bartholomew, Robert Lawrence, Tommy Lewis, Welton Armstead, Welton Armstead, Frank Diggs, Alprentis Bunchy Carter, John Huggins, Alex Rackley, John Savage, Sylvester Bell, Larry Robertson, Nathaniel Clark, Walter Toure Pope, Spurgeon Winters, Fred Hampton, Sterling Jones, or Fred Hampton, Mark Clark, Sterling Jones, Eugene Anderson, Babatunde X. Omwale, Carl Hampton, Jonathan Jackson, Fred Bennett, Sandra Lane Pratt, Robert Webb, Samuel Napier, Harold Russell, and George Jackson. These are all the Panthers that at least documented were murdered as a result of FBI initiated disruption and terror in three short years. Again, knowing and being aware of the level of repression that our organized struggle faces is necessary. It's also disheartening, truthfully, because you see the result, right, of, of highly organized and, and determined African people. You see the demise that so many of us have met. And yet we persist, right? And yet we, we advance. Anti-Panther COINTEL Pro activities were directed not only at blocking or destroying the party's coalition building. They were, as the accompanying November 25th, 1968 memo from Hoover to the SAC in Baltimore bears out, also devoted to exacerbating tensions between the BPP and organizations with, with which it had strong ideological differences. This is very important. Listen to this. This, this quote right here is a, is a direct e excerpt from the memo. Um, from the FBI. In order to fully capitalize on BPP and US differences, and US, this is not US, the United States, this is US, um, us, the uh, cultural nationalist organization um, led by Ron Karenga at the time, right? In order to fully capitalize on BPP and US differences, as well as to exploit all avenues of creating further dissension in the ranks of the Black Panther Party, recipient offices are instructed to submit imaginative and hard hitting counterintelligence measures aimed at crippling the Black Panther Party. Fred Hampton was showing considerable promise in negotiating a working alliance with a huge black street gang known as the Blackstone Rangers. This threat prompted the local COINTELPRO section to propose and Hoover to approve the sending of an anonymous letter to Ranger head Jeff, Jeff Ford, falsely warning that Hampton had a hit out on him as part of a Panther plot to take over his gang. So the Chicago section of COINTELPRO recognized the progress Fred Hampton was making in negotiating an alliance with the Blackstone Rangers. They saw this progress taking place and they got approval from the FBI director to, to, uh, to doctor and to fabricate a letter that suggests um, Fred Hampton was plotting on murdering, right, the head of the Blackstone Rangers, Jeff Ford. 
And that prevented that alliance from taking place. That was a direct uh, tactic employed by this program. Similar tactics were employed to block or destabilize emerging alliances between the Chicago Black Panther Party, another black gang, the Mau Maus, as, as well as the already politicized Young Lords, the Young Patriots, and even SDS, a white radical organization. The, the letter writing COINTEL Pro had a significant impact in preventing Hampton from consolidating the citywide rainbow coalition he was attempting to establish at the time. So we've done the analysis of Fred Hampton, his early beginnings, his early organizing beginnings, his, his uh, ascension to the position of chairman, right? His connectedness to other prominent leaders and events throughout the world. We've done our analysis on the raid, the events leading up to it and the events that transpired subsequently. And now we've conducted our analysis of COINTELPRO. So for further reading, um, again, the assassination of Fred Hampton by Jeffrey Haas. This is again, the, the, the pinnacle of analysis um, on the raid, the aftermath, the, the, the precursors to the raid, so on and so forth. There's Mark Clark, Soul of a Black Panther by Gloria Clark Jackson, a very intimate and, and uh, profound account of Mark Clark's life and his, his uh, untimely assassination. In fact, I'll read something from the book that really illustrates the true lifelong sacrifice and commitment made by the Black Panthers, right? So this is um, on page 69 of the book, um, chapter 11 entitled The Last Car Ride. And Gloria Clark Jackson, again, a sister of Mark Clark, is, is writing this book and she's documenting her relationship and her time with Mark Clark. She says, it was just before Thanksgiving 1969 when I called my mother, Flint, when I called my mother in Flint, Michigan and asked if I could come to Flint to relocate with her. Without, without hesitation, she said yes. She and my older brother, William, drove down from Flint to Peoria to pick me up. The following day, just as we were about to leave, Mark came out and asked to be dropped off in Chicago. Mark must have been prepared to leave because he already had his bags packed. We were all nervous that day. Things had gotten so bad in Chicago that we feared for Mark's life. About a week prior, a former Chicago Black Panther member named Spurgeon Winters, Jake Winters, had been killed in a shootout with the Chicago police where two police officers had also been killed. My oldest brother, William, was driving while my mother sat on the front passenger side. Mark, my one-year-old son, Michael, and I sat in the back. We didn't talk much at first during that trip because we already felt the sense of doom. Then Mark opened up the conversation and began speaking to me about the Black Panther Party. Mark said that there was a lot of dissension in the Chicago chapter and that Fred Hampton didn't know who he could trust. Mark went on to say that Fred suspected that the party had been infiltrated with FBI inform informants because information was constantly being leaked out. The problem was he didn't know who they were. Hearing that, both William and I tried our best to persuade Mark to come to Flint instead of staying in Chicago to Mark, but Mark flat out refused. To Mark, leaving the party now would mean betraying his comrade and friend, Fred Hampton, and that was something he was not willing to do. Mark was the defense captain of the, of the Black Panther Party, and he had made a vow to defend the party at all costs. Mark was well aware that his life was in danger, but he had reached the point of no return. When we got to Chicago, Mark instructed William to drop him off on a particular corner. He got out of the car, grabbed his bags from the trunk, and laid them on the curb gave us all a hug and a kiss, then he said these devastating words. I probably won't see y'all again, but just know that I love all of you. A week later, Mark was dead. Just that brief story really illustrates the commitment these Africans, these warriors, these Panthers made to the struggle of our people, to the, the cause, to the Black Panther Party, to organization, right? Then we have um, another recommended uh, 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 book for further reading, the COINTELPRO papers. These are actual uh, printed documents from the FBI secret wars against dissent in the United States. And so now um, uh, we're gonna play just a brief clip of 
uh, our brother chairman, and I want us to really reflect on his words. Uh, and then I'm going to open up the discussion a bit, um, and we can just kind of share out what we are gathering from uh, um, Chairman Fred and what, what we can learn from it. So I'll go ahead and play it, and then we'll you know, have some discussion. So we got to understand here the educational program that you have to be able to figure out whether it will go on the right lines where the people will end up in a situation where they can be able to really control themselves. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, with no education, the people that take this local foundation and start stealing money because they won't be really educated to why it's the people thing anyway. You understand what I'm saying? With no education, you have neo-colonialism instead of colonialism like you got in uh, Africa 9, like you got in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti. So what we're talking about is there has to be uh, an educational program. That's very important. As a matter of fact, we are so important for us that a person has to go through six weeks of our political education before he can consider himself a member of the party, able to even run down ideology for the party. Why? Because if they don't have an education, then they know where. You dig what I'm saying? They know where because they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. You, you might get people caught up in the emotionless movement. Uh, you understand me? You might be get them caught up in because they're poor and they want something. And then if they're not educated, they want more. And before you know it, they'll be capitalists. And before you know it, we'll have Negro imperialists. Okay. So we got to understand here. So as we engage the words and teachings of our ancestors, the main priority we should keep is that we study our past so that we may adequately prepare for our future. We cannot study our history only in the spirit of celebration. We must draw lessons from the contributions of our ancestors to our global struggle. So real briefly, um, if, if, if we all are, are comfortable, I would like to hear from uh, uh, any of us who, who have been tapped in what Brother Fred is, is speaking on in terms of uh, education prior to action, right? What, what can we gather this means? What, what do we think he's trying to teach us, right? And feel free, you can either uh, um, unmute yourself and, and share it you know, verbally. You can put it in the chat, um, how, however you'd like to share. Um, let's start though, uh, let's hear from our, our, our dear sister, um, Sister Raina, um, talk to us. Share with us just in that first, in, the, in that, you know, in that brief clip, um, what is he, what's Chairman Fred talking about? Um, for me, I take it as, unless you understand why you are a part of the we and really accept that you are a part of the we, then when certain temptations, when certain um, adversities come along, you will be tempted to give up on the we or turn your back on the we because you're not really you don't get it, you just don't get it. So without the education and first you educate and then you have them take it in and then they believe it because they are it. And without that, like that's the roots. So it, it's kind of like, it gave me chills because we see unfortunately, right? That the Black Panther Party was able to be infiltrated um, right. for that very reason. And, and he fought very hard against that so that is just so it's crucial like we can't just put on the black jacket and wear the beret you have to have a foundation and be anchored so that's what i took from it that's right thank you thank you thank you anyone else um uh, again you you can just drop it in the chat and i'll read it um or if, you know you we, we would love to to hear from you directly um uh, but we're, you know we just want to kind of talk about just real briefly um what chairman fred is is speaking on when he talks about to educate our people prior, prior to engaging in action with our people, right? So we just heard from Sister Raina, um, who, who so eloquently and, and uh, 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 immaculately uh, <laughs> uh, taught us, right, what, what Chairman Fred is teaching us. Um, does anyone else want to share? And you don't have to. I'm, I'm not going to, like, not proceed. Um, but if anyone would like to, you know, the, 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 the floor is open and the time is now. Uh, I think uh, when I was listening to it, I was just thinking, like, uh, piggyback off what Raina was saying, like, education must be a foundation. Like, uh, I think without education, like, uh, like he was saying, we we gonna end up with like a, a, a Negro imperialist, or uh, we gonna have neo colonialism. Like, right. We don't have a foundation of why we doing what we doing, and we just gonna end up enforcing white supremacy with blackface. That's what I. Think. Right. Absolutely, thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Um, absolutely, right. And, and again, as, as we uh, 
look at just these words, right, in our reflection. We, we need to be sure that our intention is just as clearly set as our uh, uh, vision, right, for organization or for freedom for our people. We need to be sure we are uh, not only aiming the right way, but we are, are aiming with the right stuff. We are, you know, uh, uh, putting ourselves in that proper position, right? Someone said, education is the foundation. We need to be educated about our oppression in order to have a strong movement. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. We, we cooking now. Okay. 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 So um, with that, we'll go ahead and, and, and transition. Um, these are our references. Um, as always, the political education wing of the African Black Coalition cites their sources. Um, you know, we don't just get on and, and, and engage in conjecture. We don't just talk. Uh, we really research and we really study this um, because it's, it's what we're supposed to do, right? So um, this has been another edition of P with ABC. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, I am the political education director for the African Black Coalition, Makona Tendaji. And if there are no further questions or comments or concerns, um, thank you all for tuning in. And hopefully you will, you know, choose to further engage, not just with political ed um, content, but with, you know, all uh, ABC programming in the near future. So thank you all again and peace. Africa will be free. <laughs>